to start by just praying together again. Lord God, Father in heaven, after all these years, I thank you for your word. I thank you that you continue to speak generation to generation across the ages, across geography, across culture. Sometimes your word is refreshing to a weary soul. Sometimes your word turns my perspective upside down. Sometimes your word slices deep into the core of who I am. Sometimes it binds me and heals me and pushes me forward. But we recognize today we're opening your word. And God, I'm humbled by that opportunity to be a part of that. I simply ask that it be your word, not mine. And that you speak to all of us this morning. Words that for some will be easy to hear, for others will be more difficult. We do trust you and place ourselves in your hand. As Pastor Stephen said, Father, give us ears to hear. Lives that are eager and um, excited to put this truth into practice. I pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. So there are two truths in this world that largely define the social development of humanity. We learn these truths as, as very young children. Um, the very first time we find ourselves actually amidst... Um, thanks, Stephen. The first time we find ourselves amidst uh, a group of other children... And we end up spending the rest of our lives kind of incorporating these truths in the way that we relate to the world. Um, these two truths continue to shape our adult lives in all sorts of ways. Um, they are at the heart of probably every major turning point in world history. They certainly at the heart of this week's headlines, both domestically and internationally. Two truths that shape people and have brought heartbreak and horror into the world. Two truths are simple. Number one, there is us. Number two, there is them. And as kids, we learn that real quickly. As kids, we learn very fast, I want to be part of us. <laughs> I want to belong. I want to fit in. Um, Maybe we don't recognize the us and them when we're really little in a place of innocence and everything's just fun and discovery is taking place. But at some point, something competitive happens. Some kid takes the toy from somebody else. Somebody does something and all of a sudden we find ourselves in our first even childish conflict. Us distinguished from them. And once once a child discovers us versus them, everyone else quickly figures it out as well, and they start aligning themselves to us versus them. And, and you want to strive to be us, right? Um, you will sometimes morph yourself to fit in, to be us. Or uh, maybe you'll try to influence what defines us so that it better fits you. You might even create a narrative for them, and that narrative doesn't necessarily have to be true, it just has to be something that makes the us look more desirable than the M, them, and so we, we tell a tale, us versus them, um, and if we're successful, more people will want to be a part of us than be a part of them, and as we grow up, we continue embracing those labels to define our us. Um, many times it's just something that's very innocent. Um, you may have your favorite jersey from your favorite sports team. I'm part of that group that's the, the us. We're all fans of whatever. Um, you might uh, identify with some club or some social activity that you belong to. You're dog people or cat people. You are morning people or night owls. You are Apple users or Android users. You're right or left, conservative or progressive, and whatever you are, you are probably pretty sure whether you could actually articulate this or not, you're pretty sure that your us is right and the them is wrong, or the us is better than the them, 
Or if you're in the minority, then your us somehow um, is superior to them in the way that the vast majority of them don't know. And if only them could understand the us is better. Um, or at the very least, the us wants to shame the them for making fun of the us because that's how that works. I was thinking about that as I got ready this morning today. Uh, in my closet, I have a whole bunch of t-shirts and hoodies that have different colleges on them, either schools that I was a part of or um, that my kids might have gone to, so Biola and Marymount and William and & Mary and Virginia Tech, and they're basically us labels, right? They're, you put on that thing and you say, I'm, I identify somehow some connection to this as an us. It's really easy to create us and them, by the way. We do it in society all the time. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you something. Bear with me, be patient. But if you were born in the United States, anywhere in any of the 50 states, would you stand up for just a moment? If you were born in the US. Now look around the room. We have created an us and them. There is us that are standing, there are them that are sitting. I don't know what it feels like to be sitting right now. Bear with me, I'm going somewhere with this. Um, but the sitting down people are different from the standing up people. We've simply divided ourselves by geography. But we can continue to separate that. So if you were born west of the Mississippi, stay standing. If you were born east of the Mississippi, sit down. Notice we just switched the majority to the minority that are standing up. Right? So we have a different us and a different them. And, and in this case, we just defined the us by the one thing they have in common, where they were born, and the them are defined by where they were not born. They're defined as contrary to the, the us. Do you see how that works? Okay, you can all sit down. I just want to show, it's, it takes nothing to divide those labels, and, and, and most of them are innocent. Most of them don't really matter. Uh, my, my mother went to Auburn University, War Eagle. Oh, I even have a sweatshirt for Auburn, so there I, they've got one of those too. Um, almost all the relatives on my mother's side of the family are Auburn fans, but I have one cousin who's a diehard Alabama fan, Roll Tide. And uh, I remember being in Alabama, and it was the rivalry game between Auburn and Alabama. And so we were watching on TV, and and everybody was kind of cheering for Auburn except for my one cousin who was cheering for Alabama who won the game. And boy, did he put that in everybody's face. And, but I was listening to this family dynamic. I'm from California. Like, um, I didn't care. But um, it, was, it was innocent, teasing sort of stuff mostly. I'm not so sure my one cousin felt that way as much by the end of the day. But for the most part, us and them are just whatever. It's not a big deal. But sometimes us and them gets really, really ugly. On Sunday nights this month, I've been helping out uh, a good friend over at the winery at Bull Run. I don't know if you've ever been over there, but they do this historical tours thing because it's right where the Battle of Bull Run was founded. And um, in October, they do them at night in the dark, and they tell some of the darker stories of what happened during the Civil War over there. And uh, I get to to be a storyteller, I, I get to tell the role of the profiteer explaining kind of the horrors that took place in the prisons um, during the Civil War. Um, but that whole period of history, us and them, became bitter and ugly. Over, well over half a million people died, the blue and the gray, right? And at the very heart of that conflict came probably one of the worst examples of us and them, racism. The, the ultimate dehumanization of another person with slavery. Um, us and them in a way that just ruins lives for generations. I admit, uh, I grew up in California in the late 60s and early 70s, and um, racial issues have been a struggle for me. Because when I was growing up, it was right toward the end of the height of the Civil War, or Civil War, <laughs> Civil Rights. Whew, tell what I've been doing this month. Civil Rights Movement. 
And, and it was drilled into us very intentionally in the school program at that time. There was a goal to make my generation the colorblind generation. It was all in the news. We're going to be colorblind. Some of you know what I'm talking about. You heard that phrase, we're going to be colorblind. That there is only one race, it is the human race. And, and we were taught over and over and over again not to pay attention to things like um, skin color or racial heritage. And I can't tell you how many times uh, we heard the Martin Luther King Junior quote again and again and again. And if you were to ask me growing up um, about the racial background of my friends, I would have had to stop and actually think about it because I didn't see Ed as black and I didn't see Brian as, as Asian and I didn't see Jamie as uh, Latino. I, I realize now it's because I had the advantage of white privilege that I didn't have to see that. But I was taught, you don't recognize color. Today, I realize that that is an incredible disservice. It's damaging to uh, dismiss someone's racially, cultural, distinctive things that make them feel a part of us, that gives them a sense of pride, that this is something about who I am. It's a distinctive that I value. Don't diminish it. Don't wipe it away. Don't pretend it doesn't exist. It actually is significant today. Um, but I have to be intentional about that because my autopilot was drilled in pretty heavy as a kid. Sadly, there are people, whether they recognize it or not, that walk through life constantly labeling everybody as us and them. And it might be a racial thing, it might be uh, gender, it might be education, it might be economic standing, it might be political affiliation, it might be religion. It's a universal truth we've learned since we were little kids. Now, I know you're asking, what does this have to do with Ephesians? I'll get there. We're actually going to explore the second half of Ephesians 2 before we're done, but I want you to understand the context going into it. And to do that, I want to make what I think could be a controversial and potentially offensive statement. Do I have your attention? Us and them, conceptually foundationally, as a concept, as a, a principle that defines relationship, are ultimately based in evil. Maybe not every application of it. I'm, I'm all into friendly competition too. I'm all into pride of an organization and, and rivalry and all of that. But us and them at the very root contradict the nature and the character of God who defines himself as what? I am the Lord, I am one. So think about this for a moment. <clears throat> at the dawn of time, God placed man and woman in paradise, in a place where they could feast uh, from the tree of life, where they could walk in complete innocence, never any fear, never any shame, never any harm or sorrow or grief or conflict or anything like that, totally intimate with each other, the two shall be one flesh, totally intimate with God who was there with them at all times until they decided that that maybe they're missing something, that God was holding back on them, that, that there was more to it than what God had given them and that what they were missing was good and they would be better off knowing both good and evil and being responsible for making the choice between those. And thus, they introduced sin into the world and they introduced corruption and they introduced um, sorrow and death and misery. And what's the first thing that happens? They wanna cover themselves, they wanna hide. All of a sudden, they feel alienated, they feel different from God. They're aware of how they're different, and they pull apart. And the very next historical sin we read about is their kids, where we have Abel, who is a rancher, who um, brings the very first and the very best of his flock as a gift to, the God, uh, to God, as a, an act of worship, and God embraces that gift. And we have Cain, who is a farmer who offers some of what he had to God, apparently not the first and the best. And God says, mm, you don't get to diminish me that way. And, and we have an us and them taking place between Cain and Abel. And Abel, you're connected to God and I'm not. And rather than embracing God's invitation to say, I, I want you to experience that intimacy with, the, with me too. I want you to worship the way your brother did. I want you to understand that I am worthy of the first and the best of all that you offer. One brother takes it upon himself to kill the other, and thus we have death from an us and them dynamic. 
us and them literally brought death into the world. And that kind of conflict has continued generation after generation after generation. Maybe not so violently, but mankind has had a habit of drawing lines on a map, squabbling about resources, fighting countless wars, committing atrocities, all because of us and them. And to this day, people continue to think in us and them. Out of curiosity, anybody here ever get themselves involved in a conflict of any kind? My wife is honest, thank you. It wasn't us, was it? No, I mean, we find ourselves thinking that way. What happens when you get yourself in a conflict with us and them? Sometimes you're inclined to rally the emotional support troops, misery loves company, and you find yourself creating and expanding the us and the them. God's plan has always been to redeem creation from us and them and that whole way of thinking. So remember what we saw at the very beginning of the letter to the Ephesians just a couple of weeks ago. We are told this. This is the plan. At the right time, God will bring everything together under the authority of Christ, everything in heaven and on earth. One ruler, one community, one kingdom, one tribe, one banner, one team jersey, the complete redemption and unity of creation, which has led um, God's people, the Hebrews, to say things like Shabbat Shalom when they gather to worship. Rest, Shabbat, in peace, shalom. What a beautiful blessing. Perfect rest, perfect peace, a return to paradise. No conflict, no us and them, just peaceful unity forevermore. Paul goes on in the next couple of verses to talk about how both the Jews and the Gentiles then are made one in the unity of Christ as part of God's plan to bring everything together. We're going to see that again in chapter 2 when we finally get to those verses in a few moments. God is in the process of redeeming us from us and them. What did Jesus pray for on his last time with his disciples as they shared the last supper together before his, his crucifixion? He said, I am praying not only for these disciples that I've gathered sharing this meal with, but I am praying for all who will ever believe in me through their message. That includes you and me. Jesus said, I pray that they will be one, just as you and I are one. As you are in me, Father, and I am in you, may they be in us so the world will believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory you gave me so that they may be one as we are one. In the same dynamic of the intimate union of God, he wants us to experience that with him and with each other. I am in them, you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity Something that so defies the us and them mentality that the world will see the unique difference of that. The world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. Do you hear it? Do you hear how oneness is really important to God and it's where he's heading us toward? So what does the community of God, the, the kingdom, end up looking like? Paul writes to the Galatians, you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. You're brought together in the same banner, in the same dynamic. You are all now God's children, and all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ, like putting on new clothes. We wear a new team jersey now. We're defined by the same label, Christ. There is no longer um, Jew or Gentile, no longer slave or free, no longer male or female because you are one in Christ Jesus. Again, are you hearing it? This is important before we open Ephesians or Ephesians 2 won't make sense. You need to hear God's driving plan to make us one. What does eternity look like when history is all finished and all the consequences of sin have been resolved forevermore and we stand in the very presence of God in this eternal glorious day that will never end? 
I see a vast crowd. It is too great to count from every nation, every tribe, every people, every language. What brings them together is they stand in front of the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in the same uniform, clothed in white robes, holding palm branches in their hand, shouting with a great roar. All these different languages brought together for a single voice and a single message. Salvation comes from our God who sits on the throne and from the Lamb. Forever and ever and ever, the elimination of the mentality of us and them in favor of the magnificent tapestry of unity and worship. Now, this is just a personal opinion, <clears throat> but I suspect God grieves over the way his kingdom has been portrayed to the world as fragmented and divided. Over history, the church, the followers of Jesus have shattered. We define ourselves to the rest of the world by our differences, not by our unity. Um, traditions and rituals and music styles and cultural preferences and personalities We've let us and them become a part of the way we experience kingdom. And identifying ourselves by these differences becomes so normative. I don't know that it will ever be restored until Christ comes to redeem us once again into the one that he always intended for us to be. Even small groups of people, clusters of friends, a local church, a family, can fall victim to us and them dynamics. Um, when we get our feelings hurt or we think we've identified some injustice, we almost instinctively create an us and them mentality and that leads to gossip and backbiting and complaint and gathering allies and fracturing God's people. In a couple of weeks, we're gonna see in Ephesians 4 the appeal of God for us to never allow that to happen, to steer clear of us and them dynamics, especially within the kingdom of God, so that we can reveal what his glory looks like. So here's what Paul writes. Here's what God says. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. Every effort. Because there is only one body and one spirit as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and in all and living through all. Which leads to all the one another's in the Bible, right? Love one another. Be patient with one another. Encourage one another. Forgive one another. Make allowances for one another's faults. Pursue peace with one another. Again and again, God says this has to be a priority because it's what he's trying to reveal to the world. We worship the prince of what? Peace. Even, even the most famous definition of love in Scripture, Christ says that, that we will be seen by the world as belonging to him based on the love that we reflect to each other, this thing that binds us together, the love of God that overcomes everything for us to be united. That, that is defined for us in Scripture by Paul. He says love, the, the way that oneness looks like, it's patient. Love is kind. Love is not jealous, it is not boastful, it is not proud, it is not rude, it does not demand its own way, it is not irritable, it keeps no record of being wronged, it does not rejoice with injustice, but it rejoices when truth uh, wins out. Love never gives up, love, love never loses faith, love is always hopeful, love will endure through every circumstance. But that means we have to move beyond the us and the them of the playground that we learned it. Um, too often we become adversarial despite the dishonor that brings to God's reputation. So Paul even goes so far as to say what to do when you perceive someone acting in a way that thrusts us and them into the kingdom of God. He says, if people are causing divisions among you, you give them a first warning, 
You give them a second warning, and after that, have nothing to do with them. That's harsh. People like that have turned away from the truth. Their own sins condemn them. And that's obviously never the goal. The goal is unity, but God takes this preservation of unity so seriously because he wants us to reflect redemption and unity and grace and love, not division and bitterness and fracturing. Now, knowing this truth of what God is pursuing allows us to open the second half of Ephesians 2 and make sense of what might otherwise seem to be an ancient passage that refers to old racial kinds of reconciliations. And yes, it does have to do with racial reconciliation, but it has to do with so much more because it is the heart of God for his kingdom to pursue unity, not us versus them. So just as a reminder, the first half of Ephesians, this letter that Paul wrote, the first three chapters all define our identity in Christ. He says, this is who you are. The second half, the last three chapters say, because this is who you are, because that is true, this is how you live. This is what that looks like in life. So when we're in Ephesians 2, he's going to be defining identity in the sense of the unity that allows us to pursue that kind of oneness. And he writes this. Don't forget that you Gentiles used to be outsiders. All right. He's writing to the town of Ephesus. Most of the people are Greek. They're not Jewish. If you're not Jewish, you're a Gentile, in case you didn't know. He says, you Gentiles were outsiders. You were the them. You were called uncircumcised heathens by the Jews who were proud of their circumcision. They were proud of this, this covenant tradition in which they actually marked their flesh as belonging to the covenant of Abram that distinguished them as part of God's chosen people. He says, but it only affected their bodies. It didn't affect their hearts. It didn't matter what external jersey you wore. It didn't matter how you marked your flesh. It didn't matter because your hearts were what it really mattered. In those days, he says, you Gentiles, you people reading this letter, once you lived apart from Christ, you were excluded from the citizenship among God's people of Israel. You didn't know the covenant promises that God had made to them. You lived in this world as them, not as us. You lived without God. You lived without hope. But God decided, in a way that only God could, to redeem mankind from us and them by working through us and them. So about 2,000 years before Christ, God chose this guy named Abram. And if you read the book of Hebrews, it says, God chose Abram, and it goes on for several chapters, because it was Abram that God chose. Okay, that's the logic. And he says, I am going to create from you a new us. I'm going to have you travel to a new location, leave everything behind, leave your family, leave all your identifiers. I'm going to put you in a new place and create a new nation out of you, Abram. You're going to be my new us. And then after a few generations, they found themselves enslaved for four centuries in Egypt. God raises up Moses and says, now it's time, now that there's a couple of million of you, it's time for me to take this new us and make you my covenant people. And through a number of events, he leads them into deliverance, and he gives them the law that will define their society and define their relationship from God or with God and reveal kind of what the holiness of God looks like. And then after time, as they settle into a new land, he raises up a king named David who will establish a throne that will one day be ruled on from, by, by Christ who will rule over the entire world from a place called Yerushalom, the city of peace where the Prince of Peace will rule all creation. And God takes this us and them, and he says, all right, this is my covenant people, this is my plan, but it's never been just for that. My goal is to take everyone else and make them a part of this, to make a new us out of this. And so Paul writes here in Ephesians, now you who have been a them this whole time, now you are united with Christ. Once you were far away, now you've been brought near to him through the blood of Christ because Christ has brought peace. Erene, shalom. The end of us and them in favor of healing and connection and union. Christ has established peace for us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people 
when in his own body on the cross, he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. He did this by ending the system of law, by fulfilling the law on our behalf. Because frankly, if you look at the whole law and you said, I need to do this to measure up to God, you're going to fall short really fast. You need someone to do that for you. All the law does is prove that you're guilty and inadequate and in need of a savior. So rather than these rules that govern this society of us versus that society of them, God says, all of you are the them and the fact that none of you could fulfill it, so I will fulfill it for all so that you can become a new us. You're united with Christ in this. He did this by ending the system of law with its commandments and its regulations, and he made what? Peace between Jew and Gentile by creating in himself one new people from the two groups. So together, as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of his death on the cross so that our hostility toward each other is put to death. See again the heart of God to get rid of us and them, to get rid of conflict, to get rid of hostility and restore peace. He brought this good news of what? Peace to you who once were them, who once were far away, and peace to those who were near. And so now all of us can come to the Father through the same Holy Spirit, one God, one Spirit, one baptism, one faith, one Lord above all because of what Christ has done for us. God ends up taking the rubble of what we have created out of life and society and relations, the, the brokenness, the, the bitterness, the, the pain and division, the resentment, the, the unforgiveness. He takes all that junk that we have fulfilled our lives and our society with. And he says, I'm going to redeem it and take all of these broken pieces and I'm going to build something new and beautiful and one out of it. So now you Gentiles, he says, you're no longer strangers. You're no longer foreigners. You are citizens along with all of God's holy people. You are now members of the same family. And together we become this house, this building built on the foundation of what the apostles and the prophets have taught, the, the cornerstone of which is Christ Jesus himself, we are carefully now all joined together in him to become this holy temple for the Lord. And through him, you Gentiles are also made a part of this dwelling where God lives by his spirit. What a remarkably beautiful word picture God gives. He takes the rubble of you and me and builds together a dwelling place of God where there is no us and them. There is a oneness where God himself is manifest in this world. God is no longer manifest as Shekinah glory behind a heavy curtain in the holy of holies set apart from the world, separated from the world. He no longer dwells uniquely in a Jewish us versus a Gentile them. He no longer walks through this world as a carpenter's son from Israel. God dwells in you and me as this new temple, this new dwelling place of God. We are the body of Christ. We are to represent what the unity of God looks like to the rest of the world. And this, at the risk of being repetitive, is why God says, make every effort to keep yourself united in the Spirit. So remember, the first three chapters are who you are. We're going to get to chapter four, which is going to say, this is what you do. I want you to see the connection in advance. It's because God is redeeming us from us and them to become something else that we must make every effort to pursue that union, to bind ourselves together in what? This is why God says, I appeal to you, brothers, watch out for those who will cause divisions or create obstacles contrary to the doctrine you've been taught. Avoid them. This is why God says, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree that there be no divisions among you, that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. And yeah, that takes a lot. If you are entrenched in an us and them mentality, and that has become a place of conflict, and you're in a place of pain and resentment and unforgiveness, it takes an incredible trust in the grace of God to let all of that go and embrace something different. But this is the heart of God. This is what we're called to. This is why God takes the broken pieces of our lives and builds a dwelling place for himself. 
This is why God doesn't care if you're rich or poor or slave or free or male or female or educated or whatever you might be, whatever labels and jerseys define you. God says, I have one label for you. It's Christ. Me and you, you and me, you and each other. I watch the news and I see the horrors of the Middle East and my heart grieves deeply, not only because of the human suffering and the hatred and the sorrow, but because conflict is contrary to the heart of God. I listen to political chatter and my heart grieves deeply, not because of conflicting ideology or contradictory strategies for how best to govern society, but because our culture has forfeited respect and decency and communication and cooperation in favor of defensive and divisive rhetoric. I, I, I sit in a therapy session with a husband and wife who are able to articulate what they both want more than anything in the whole world is a happy marriage, but they have broken that harmony because they cannot seem to move past a, com a competitive adversarial mindset in their relationship that leads to explosive emotions and hurtful words and self-protectiveness and guarded mistrust. And my heart grieves because that's not what the love of Christ looks like for his bride. I watch friendships crumble with deception and gossip and hyperbole and selfishness. My heart grieves because of childhood behaviors that become complex and articulated into adult life but leave people wounded. I see churches in our culture fragmented and competitive with people stuck in consumerism, hopping from place to place, making it all about them, doing so with criticism and self-interest, and my heart grieves because we're not showing the world what the heart of Christ looks like, the oneness to which we are called. Ephesians is really clear here, guys. And I'm left as my heart grieves, recognizing there's only one thing I can do, and this is for each of us. We may have been taught two fundamental truths. There is us and there is them. And God says, I need you to replace that with something new. There is we. <laughs> More theologically, there is Christ. There is Christ. It's no longer I who live. It's Christ who lives in me. This life I live in this body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loves me and gave himself up for me. Yes? Yes? There is him. And the only life that will persist beyond the us and them of this world, beyond history and geography, the only life which is eternal is Christ's and Christ's alone in us. God loves me and God loves you and God loves that person who is the furthest away on your them list which means you lust, must love me, and you must love you, and you must love any them you run into, because God is redeeming to make a we. For that to happen, every one of us has to be self-aware and competi uh, competitive, self-aware um, and, and broken, I suppose, is the best word. There has to be humility in that. There has to be a trust in God that, that you don't have to engage in us and them. Some of you know my favorite psalm. It begins with the words, the Lord is my fortress, in him I will not be afraid. Though the oceans roar and the mountains fall in the sea and chariots and guys with bows and arrows go nuts and mankind is full of conflict, I will recognize that there is joy where God is. There's a river of delight in his presence, and my job is to be still and know that he is God, and he will be glorified, not to engage in the us and the them of the world, but to engage in Christ. And everything else is fine. Christ heals all wounds. Christ replaces every lie with truth. Christ is safe. Shabbat shalom. 
Rest in peace is this weird sort of graveyard phrase, right? Halloween weekend. Rest in peace. It sounds scary. But if you think about it, it's such a beautiful blessing. Rest. Be at peace now and forever. For this is God's desire for you. So in so much as it depends on us, Shabbat Shalom. Heavenly Father, I know in saying these words, in cracking open this very ancient letter, we, we dip into stuff that defines us. Every one of us in here. I, I recognize, God, there are those who are walking through life in this place, in this moment, who are just experiencing the serenity of peace because, because that's where you have them in the story of their life right now. That's the chapter that they're living, and it's a delight, and it's wondrous. May they be contagious with that peace to us and to the world around them. And I know there are people gathered in this setting as there would be in any setting who that this chapter of their life is filled with us and them. They're filled with conflict. And, and, and it's easy to sit here and hear these words and, and resist and, and wrench and shake and pull ourselves from this truth and try to find ways to say this doesn't apply to our circumstance. And yet there it is. It's so timeless. You are in the business of redeeming us from us and them. For that, God, I'm grateful. I look at the end chapter. I look forward to the end of the story for you've described to us what it's going to look like. We all get to rest in peace in an eternal Shabbat, in an eternal Shalom. May we live in that oneness now in so much as it depends on us. And yeah, the world, Father, is broken, and you know that. And it's hard to be at peace with someone who's filled with hatred. It's hard. It's hard to overcome bias that is so normalized. We're clever creatures, God. We, we rationalize and euphemize and and make all sorts of new ways of defining the things that are contrary to your holiness. Pull us free from that, God. Redeem us from us and them. Make us one with you and with each other. May that simple label of Christ overcome anything that might make us different or divide us. Where there is pain, God, bring healing. Where there is unforgiveness, God, bring restoration. Shabbat Shalom. In Christ's name.